Great. I'd like to welcome everyone today to the Resilience Through Clarity session. Appreciate you carving some time out of your busy schedule to join us and to hopefully gather some insight into what will really draw value from process mining uh, coupled with process discovery. The two constructs have uh, made quite the impact and um, will continue to do so as we walk through some of the details and show you uh, how and why we're doing that. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to introduce the panel of speakers that will be with us today. Uh, first, we have uh, Rob Kopowitz from Forrester. He's a VP Principal Analyst. Uh, he's our guest speaker for the day. Uh, we also have our friends and our strategic partners from Minet joining us, uh, namely Rosto Hlevach, who is the CEO of Minet. And from my organization, we have uh, N. Shashidar, or Shashi, joining us. He's an AVP and Senior Director of Alliances, uh, along with Shrikant Deo, who is uh, uh, Associate Director of Product Management. My name is Carl Benefield, and I work in uh, the Strategic Partnerships and Alliances space, and I'm looking forward to an exciting event. For questions and comments, I think what we'll do is we'll reserve those to the end. There will be a Q&A session. Uh, but for now, I wanted to, to start with a quote, which is, forgive me, a little melodramatic, but I think entirely apropos for the topic at hand, which is, adopt or perish now as ever in nature, inexorable imperative, essentially adopt or die. And that's a, a pretty strong statement uh, made famous, namely by H.G. Wells. But in this context, I think it's uh, appropriate considering what we're all faced with now that uh, COVID-19 has uh, essentially run its course globally. And we're now uh, starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel um, by way of a vaccine and, and hopefully uh, a different world in, in the coming months. I think it's important for us to, to really uh, dig in and, and come to terms with the fact that um, the impact on enterprises, uh, any type of business has been um, pretty humbling. I think that there has been a huge amount of um, change. And for those that, that responded quickly, uh, they've seen you know uh, impressive returns uh, by way of um, productivity and output. Um, new processes, new policies, and I think that that's very much in line with what we want to speak through today. Um, those organizations that continue to adopt and track and capture the nuanced processes and sub-processes that are created in times like this are the ones that will benefit from leveraging the value of that interim phase with uh, the return to normal in the coming year. I think with that, um, what we'd like to do next is hand over and um, touch on maybe another example of where, uh, I don't know that prevention could have really done anything to, to sway the results of the Great Depression, but certainly an example of something that required um, nimble response, new policy, new adjustment, to how people were uh, served and hosted and, and helped in, in a number of different ways through programs, uh, not unlike the bread lines that were made famous in that, in that terrible time, but really a, a, a strong example of a, a time in our history when in US history where new policy in an interim period was, was essential to the survival of, of you know, most any American. And, uh, and the impact across the global, the global market as well was uh, not, uh, not anything to, uh, to take lightly. So uh, again, I think that that's a, a humbling or even a, a bit of a somber segue, but a, still a good one in, in consideration of what's happening today. So um, at this point, I'd like to, to hand over to, uh, to my, my colleague and my leader, uh, Shashi, if you could uh, step in and, and tell us how we can apply some of these uh, these new findings in, in the world of uh, our enterprise. Thanks, Carl. Good morning and good evening to all of you who have joined this webinar. Uh, thank you for your time. Hope you and your families are keeping safe. In this webinar, we will be taking you through a very powerful tool that you can leverage to drive transformation, not just within your organization, but also that of your clients. 
But before we delve deep into these tools and technologies, let's spend some time understanding the broader context in which these tools can power your Aux transformation. Right? So Srikant, if you can go to the first slide. So let's start by asking why. Right? Why are we even talking of these technologies? You know, we are really talking of these technologies because of the real power of these technologies to drive transformation. Now, every company has a strategy and they go about executing the strategy. And historically, if you have seen, most of the role of technology has been to increase the efficiency or effectiveness of the execution of the strategy, either in terms of increasing the efficiency of the business process or increasing the effectiveness and productivity of employees and assets or increasing the efficacy of operations. However, once in a while, once in a decade or so, we come across technologies that are so fundamentally changes the underlying economics that it not only helps in increasing the efficiency of execution of a strategy, it has a potential to change the company's strategy itself. And we are amidst one such technology storm, which is automation and AI. And the reason why I'm saying that it's profound is simply because it brings down, in, for example, in the case of AI, it significantly brings down the cost of prediction. And prediction is the first order of input to several activities of businesses. Now, what does this do? It has two profound impacts. One, applications that are already using prediction will continue to use more and more and the prediction will get better, faster, cheaper. And this is not just about being incremental, it can be extremely transformational as well. The second is new applications, you know, which were not using prediction will start using prediction as an input simply because of the lowering of the cost of prediction. Let me give you an example in each of these two cases. In the first case, for example, you know, all of us shop online, you know, the recommendation engine, you know, I'm sure, you know, all of us have seen that it throws up some 20 items, uh, you know, in terms of predicting what I would buy, I may end up buying only one of the 20. The accuracy is pretty lousy as of today, right? And as the accuracy slowly increases, at, at some point of time, it is only, you know, focused on increasing the user experience. But as the accuracy knob increases to about 60% or so, you know, I would end up buying 12 of the 20 items that it recommends then the e-commerce company may think, you know, reflect back and ask, you know, if I'm able to accurately predict what this guy is willing to buy, why should I even wait for him to shop? I might as well ship it, right? The same technology is being used till some point of time, it is incremental. At some point of time, it flips over to become transformational because now the company's business model has changed. Instead of shopping and then shipping, it now flips over to shipping and then shopping. Right? In that say, you know, one, I, it prevents me from going to competition online or offline. And second, now that the item is on my part, I might as well pick it up, right? So if this is a simple example of how the same technology, while it is being incremental at some point of time can potentially become transformational. Similarly, on the second example, in terms of how a new problem can be solved, which was earlier not solved through this technology, you know, the classic example being autonomous vehicles, right? Now, autonomous vehicles were never considered as a part of a prediction problem, right? You know, and we always had this, you know, self-driven uh, vehicles in shop floors and warehouses, you know, 20 years back where it was programmed saying, if this, then do this, right? If there is a human, then stop. If there is a, you know, say empty rack, go to the next rack. But you couldn't really transport this into the street because there are so infinite number of if conditions, right? The moment you realize that the cost of prediction has become so low, if you are able to reframe this problem as a prediction problem, instead of focusing on if, if I focus on then, you know, if I start predicting what a driver would do, a good driver would do, then I'm converting this into a prediction problem. And what a driver would do, the then condition is a limited set, either at time left or right or accelerate or brake, right? So then AI started taking inputs from the environment, started predicting what a driver would do, learn from what the driver actually does. And over time, it increases the accuracy so much that it can completely predict what a good driver would do. Now a driver is no more needed, right? So that's the power of the technology that we are dealing with. Now, if you go to the next slide in terms of now, if this is the real power of technology that we are dealing with, you know, how, what should we do in an organization or what should we do with our customers so that this true power is fully leveraged, 
right? We have seen industries of industry after industry where a digital native company has come and completely disrupted the industry, right? And traditional companies are struggling to survive. And the reason for that is most of the innovation is happening in the business model. When I say business model, it's about a theory of the company in terms of how they create value and how they capture the value. And, and it varies from industry to industry, right? But one thing that's common across all these companies which are creating disruption in the industry is in the underlying operating model, right? So the business model talks of how you create value and how you capture value. And the operating model talks of how you actually deliver that value. And that is something that's similar across all these companies irrespective of the industry they are in. And what I mean by a digital operating model is essentially that all the key processes that lie on the critical path of value delivery is completely digitized, automated, and AI enabled. And to a large extent, the people are moved off the critical path, right? By doing that, you're removing all the constraints related to scalability, related to the scope improvement or in terms of the learning, right? Uh, you know, the scalability is improved because of the, the digital platform. Every new customer that you want to serve, the marginal cost is near zero, right? And software by definition, by design, it's multi-sided, it's modular, and hence it can quickly increase the connections that it can do, and hence you can increase the scope of your organization. And third, of course, is the learning. The fact that it's learning happens in near real time, you know, uh, you know, people cannot even think of mimicking that, right? So that's the heart of how this technology can be leveraged. Now we go to the next slide in terms of if we really have to build this digital operating model for your company in order to drive transformation, you know, how do I do that? You know, as I mentioned earlier, the best way to start is to, you know, uh, start looking at taking each process, each task, which lie in the critical path of your value delivery and go about automating that. Right? A complex infrastructure of an end-to-end -end process automation is what underpins this digital operating model. Right? Some tasks are deterministic and hence can be easily automatable. You know, some require human in the loop. Some are more complex and probably require AI-enabled automation. But the end goal is to achieve autonomous operation. Right? Over the last three years, if you have seen, there's a significant increase in terms of the spend that's happening in the automation technology. You know, whether it's in terms of RPA or a low code or a DPA. In fact, RPA is one of the fastest growing software segment. Yet we see that, you know, we have very few clients who have adopted automation at scale, right? You now we ourselves have automation product and we work with more than 350 of the global 2000 companies helping them in automation. We have realized that, you know, less than 15% of the Fortune 250 companies have really more than 100 bots at scale. And we are, when we are talking of these kind of large companies and ability to automate end to end, 100 bots is still scratching the surface, right? And the key problems are threefold. One is the ability to scale because of the right, not selecting the right process. The second is the lack of technology governance because you have so many technologies lying around. And the most important of all is in terms of driving org changes, right? And that's where we come to the fourth segment, which is, you know, I know that I have this technology which has the power to drive automation. I know that I can leverage that by building a digital operating model. And to build a digital operating model, I need to start automating all the key processes that lie on the critical path. But where do I begin, right? And that's where our submission is that we have to take a very strategic approach. You know, we may have you know, a series of processes and tasks as a part of your automation funnel, but you have to take a very, very strategic approach at the top end of the funnel because sometimes the, the process are broken. The process is, if the process is manual, you go about digitizing it. If it is, you know, uh, not optimal, you first optimize it before you can automate, right? And that is where the tool that we want to introduce today, which is a combination of process mining and task discovery comes in handy. That's where you start because that is the strategic starting point and if you are able to get an objective view of how your current processes are running, uh, you are able to better achieve your automation at scale. Once you are able to achieve automation at scale, you will build a very sound digital operating model. And once you have a sound digital operating model, it will enable innovation in your business models. And through that, you can transform not just your company, but also in terms of the industries, not just for you, but also in terms of your clients. Right? So what I'm suggesting is this combination of process mining and task discovery. 
uh, while the process mining is designed to provide insights into how a process is getting executed, the task discovery helps get insights into the patterns of how humans are interacting with the system, right? The, uh, the data sources are different, the objectives are different. And since we said that we have to take people off the critical path, if you have to build a digital operating model, you know, task discovery becomes that much more critical. And there's this combination of process mining and task discovery that you're able to get a complete objective view of your processes as they are run today. And hence, you will be able to tell what should be your next step. Should it be digitization? Should it be optimization? Should it be compliance training? It should be training or it's ready for automation, right? So I would now request my colleague Srikant to take you in detail in terms of the value proposition of this joint offering of process mining and task discovery. Srikant, over to you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Shashi. And I hope uh, I'm audible. So thanks a lot, everyone, for joining this webinar. And uh, just to continue from where uh, Shashi left, uh, uh, so Shashi explained about why uh, we need this, this technology, which is a combination of two technologies in a, in a, in a manner, which is process mining and process discovery. But uh, we, the way we look at it is, is it's essentially we look at it as two sides of the same coin, which is essentially together powering the process excellence as it is typically required in, in an usual uh, enterprise digital transformation initiatives. And when we look at process excellence, we usually see this into four different aspects. So there is an efficiency aspect to it where obviously enterprises would want their operational processes to be as efficient as possible. Then there is an automation angle where uh, in order to not just to save operational costs, but also to make pro processes more efficient and also uh, make, make them more agile to, to the customer demands. Uh, automation is essential and uh, it is important to make uh, the processes uh, essentially uh, much more uh, nimble and agile to, to meet the demands. But the next two aspects are equally important as well. So while obviously a lot of focus usually goes around the efficiency as on, on automation, compliance is, is equally important. And especially in this uh, today's world, which is getting more and more uh, sort of uh, uh, more into regulations and different rules that, that uh, businesses have to face, compliance of the standard processes becomes extremely important. And, that becomes a, one of the key factors that a typical operational executives are always, are always bothered about in terms of whether my executives are really complying to my standard operating processes or not. And compliance usually comes from training and knowledge. Okay. Obviously, the more knowledgeable, the more experienced an executive is, uh, they are likely to comply more to the existing processes and they are also uh, likely to be more efficient. But that knowledge comes from training. Okay, so there are always opportunities uh, as part of the process excellence initiatives to drive more better training and better knowledge among the executives for the process. So when we look at all these different four aspects of excellence, process mining and process discovery, as Shashi talked about, provide some of the very important insights that can drive this entire journey. So when we talk about this, this journey together, this journey, the, the four pillars of it, the efficiency, automation, compliance, and training and knowledge, essentially form the, uh, the pillars of the digital transformation. And these pillars stand on a very, a very solid base of process data layer. Okay? And that was because without data, you really cannot transform, you cannot uh, think about improving efficiency or do uh, any re-engineering. Unless you are, the enterprise is very clear about how the processes are being executed, have some of the real parameters, data around the processes, they really can't take any decisions about transformation. And if they try to do that, they will be literally shooting in the dark and, and those transformation projects are likely to, uh, most likely to fail. So how do you create that empirical and actual data around your processes? 
one is of course the case level process data which is where process mining comes into picture and they have perfected the art over over many years uh, together but the process discovery what what it has brought to this this table is the granular operational data okay which is at a at probably the lowest granularity that is possible which is a into every single system user interaction and when you combine this case level process data with the granular system user interaction level data that really forms the bedrock of on which you can build your transformation uh, towers so what are those insights that the uh, that the process mining and, and discovery together can provide okay and and the best example what we are well, what we are talking about of this combination is the two companies that uh, that have that have sort of partnered and to create this combination so that is edgeware with its with its assisted discover product which represents the process discovery side and mine it which has the uh, process mining product so together discover and mine it provide some of the very interesting insights around each of these pillars of digital transformation that i talked about so whether it is efficiency automation compliance and training mining or mine it brings the process level insights okay and if i take an example uh, at, at in the automation uh, aspect of it mine it talks about what are the automation opportunities that are that are at a process level okay and when i when i will talk about an example going forward i will also be uh, giving example about how uh, mine it can provide process level automation opportunities but then in order to actually convert those opportunities into real automation uh, especially using technologies like rpa what is essential is a task level automation opportunities and task level insights around those and that is exactly what discover brings into the, uh, into this combination so so the process level opportunities which are which are sort of shown by the mine it are then complemented by the task level opportunities which are brought in by discover and together they can give an end to end view about automation opportunities and the same can be said for efficiency compliance and training as well so for example why mine it can train, train about who needs training which particular let's say uh, operational group or uh, contact center needs training but discover can talk about what to train on which part of the processes they need, need training and discover can also help with a ready made training content auto created training content and definition documents so in a way the the discover and mine it combination completes the end to end process analytics story uh, for the organization to get on to their transformation initiatives so as i mentioned i will be talking about a, a very interesting example of where this combination has not only sort of uh, provided insights to the client about their overall process but also went on to give very very actionable insights to the client so this particular client uh, was a pharma pharmaceutical client and and they started they while they understood the the power of each of the technology they wanted to really uh, drive a much larger digital transformation and which is why they they sort of reached out to us for a joint poc so this particular process which was a, a procure to pay process we applied both process mining and discover the interesting part is this this entire poc was executed in a manner of 7 days that's all okay and from a process mining side we used the the application logs that were created by the sap for the last year okay whereas for process discovery we specifically recorded data from three of the uh, three of the resources but here the data recorded went obviously beyond the uh, the erp application and went into many of the uh, microsoft applications as well like outlook excel and pdf and together this this data when when we when sort of went through the analysis uh, and analytics it provided very interesting insights so for example on compliance and this uh, we uh, we showed to the client that how close to about 56% of the purchase orders were created without a purchase requisition so while this may not seem a, a i mean a major problem 
the point was that this was not only sort of causing non-compliance in the process, it was also resulting in a very inefficient uh, uh, purchase order creation overall. And, and, and the, the overall compliance value itself was close to about more than 200 million based on the, the, the transactions that were flowing through the system. Similarly, efficiencies, we, we showcased that how 35% of the purchase orders needed rework. And we did not stop there. As I said, the combination of mining, mine it and discover, we were able to showcase individual transactions where the POs were created and why those transactions were inefficient because of the, the way the people were uh, executing those tasks. And, and the, the, the scale of this can be seen by the fact that close to about 350 million worth of POs needed rework. Okay? And obviously that would mean not just inefficient purchase orders, but probably delayed payments and, and uh, maybe penalties for the organization. And what we also saw, saw that while there were obviously uh, very obvious automation opportunities at certain steps of the processes, with, with Discover, we, could, we were able to show very detailed task level automation opportunities, which when we combined across the entire process, we could easily say that purely post automation itself can give the organization uh, savings of close to about $2 million every year, purely based on task automation. And finally, we also were, were able to very clearly show that while there were, there were certain service centers that seemed inefficient, we were able to pinpoint the exact processes and tasks where those people were inefficient and why they should be trained on those processes. Plus, we, will, we were able to also give them actual training material that were directly created from the task recordings. So that's what I wanted to highlight here is the fact that a very simple POC just over a period of seven days, but it shows the power of the combination of these two products together, the mine it and discover products, and how together they can, they can drive the entire digital transformation for a large client like this one. Okay. So what, what are those key capabilities of these joint solutions that can really drive this value? Okay. So while on process mining, uh, I'm sure most of many of the audience is aware of the standard process mining capabilities, which is about the ability to create a process maps and show step by step uh, the, the how the uh, a particular case or the particular purchase order or the particular invoice flows. Some of the unique capabilities that uh, Minit brings to the table is about comparing the different processes having a hierarchical drill down based process maps and mining, and then also identify some unique drivers and inhibitors that are influencing the process. Just to give an example of that previous uh, POC that I was talking about, we were able to show how a particular set of operational people sitting in a particular center were driving a lot of non-compliance. Okay? probably because of the training issue or probably because of some, some other sort of reasons. But we, we, we were able to fi find out that the influencing factors were, were very easily uh, could be found. Okay. Similarly, on the discover side, uh, which, is one of, which is the pioneering product in the process discovery, it has brought the entire uh, industry of process discovery to, to fruition. It brings very unique capabilities around very granular data capture, capturing the user system interactions, going down, as I mentioned, to the lowest possible level of a process. In fact, we, we prefer to call it as the bits and bytes of the process, which will tell you exactly what, how the task and the processes are being executed. So it not only provides the uh, as is process analysis, it obviously, generates task maps, which tell you how the process is being executed, but it can also create very interesting output right automation blueprint, which helps in automation prioritization and business case creation, especially when it comes to automation. Okay. And for to take the automation further, obviously we do not want to stop with this combination of just giving insights and analytics to the clients, we want them to be to have the tools that can actually execute those findings. So specifically for automation, Discover provides very uh, 
clear automation ready outputs like control level uh, nodes that are created in the task map, uh, process definition documents that can be directly converted into automation requirements. And in fact, Discover has now uh, sort of uh, launching very soon an auto automation, which basically will just convert the task map into straight away into an automated process. So thus, uh, Discover and Mineit can obviously not just provide you insights, but also help you convert that into real value uh, realization. So some of the differentiators that I already mentioned is one is about on the mining side, where it is about features like process compare and efficiency dashboard. But an important uh, aspect of the mining side is about the on-premise deployment. Okay? Many of the uh, uh, competitive process mining products primarily work on the cloud side. And why, what we have seen, especially when we talk to many of our enterprise clients, that some of them uh, at least seem to be wary about sending their data over to uh, a public cloud. So th this is where doing a complete on-premise deployment of the process mining and discovery products together can give a lot of uh, value to the clients and al also sort of uh, help them with their concerns on the data privacy and security. On the process discovery side, as I mentioned, it spans across multiple technologies when it talks, of, when it does the data capture. So it is no longer just restricted to your enterprise uh, application, but it can also give you very clear automation ready outputs and help you prioritize your automation candidates. And also it comes with a, uh, both the products come with a lot of flexible deployment and pricing models. Thus you can, you can basically adapt these technologies as per your digital transformation projects. Okay, uh, you can either go with a, a sort of a, a pull in sort of model, or if you want, you can even convert it into a more flexible sort of models as, as it suits your needs. So, uh, this combination can is available in both models, which is sometimes customers say that, okay, we, we just want to start with automation. So we want to start with discovery first. So we can definitely do that. We can start with a discovery discover only model, which is typical cases as, uh, as a pre automation. So if the customer is convinced that they want to go with uh, automation only, so to do the pre automation process discovery, we can start with discover while as a customer is more looking for the larger digital or process transformation sort of initiatives, which is where the discover and mine it combination is what we normally recommend, and especially around process excellence and transformation kind of use case. Okay. Uh, just to highlight that these products are very highly rated by the uh, analysts. Okay, uh, one of the first ever uh, study that was done by analysts was by Nelson Hall where they evaluated the assisted discover as the top rated product when it comes to automation focus. So if you are looking for these technologies from an automation angle, we would say that you have come to the right place. And last but not the least, I think it's very important when it comes to products like process mining and process discovery, that customers are usually sort of are, are very uh, uh, concerned and cons uh, constrained around the security and data privacy. Okay? And as, as technology vendors, we very understand these uh, customer priorities very well. Okay? And which is why we have invested very, very heavily on to making sure that we meet some of the most stringent uh, enterprise level security and data privacy guidelines. So we have used some of the uh, aspects like authentication, authorization, encryption, uh, user data protection at all different levels, having a very clear auditability of every action that has been taken on these uh, tools. And finally, having a very clear separation of concerns through a very robust role-based access controls. Okay? And all these individual uh, steps have been taken on, on a very strong base of protecting the data at every stage. Okay? And in order to do that, we have provided some core capabilities, which include the application whitelist and blacklist to ensure that the enterprise clients can choose to capture data only from specified applications. And also 
we have also taken a stringent and very clear care about masking sensitive data so that no sensitive data can get exposed uh, when 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 you are doing this sort of analysis so all assured this the the security and data privacy concerns have all been taken care and the and the uh, the proof of, of this of this sort of preparation is that we have passed some of the most stringent uh, security and privacy guide uh, uh, sort of controls for many of our enterprise clients and some some of them are even in europe okay so which means that we have passed through the gdpr uh, requirements as well and and the and and the uh, fact of that is we have some of the most enterprise grade clients as as part of our our client base okay so many of these names have utilized the combination of mining and discovery and sometimes discovery alone to not only find automation candidates but in many places go beyond automation and e execute very clear process excellence and transformation sort of initiatives okay there are many case studies but i can probably talk about uh, one of them uh, which is which is uh, one of our uh, insurance client so they while they they were maturing through their automation journey they realized the need for a discovery kind of tool because they were kind of getting stuck uh, on the use cases so while they started with core discovery and and they have identified many automation candidates with the discovery technology and and assistage discover they are now looking at a more broader process transformation because they realize that while automation has given them certain benefit they now certain processes really need a, a more broader reengineering or optimization before they can really automate them and that is now driving conversations with them and we are seeing we are helping them with the mine it and discovery combination so this is the journey what we have seen with many it was many clients okay it starts with an automation but pretty soon the clients realize that they have come to almost an end of the use cases that they could automate and they need a, a techno a product like assistage discover to drive further automation but they also realize that automation purely as a as a as a means to process transformation has a certain limitations and hence they need to broaden their horizon and this is where the mine it and discover combination can really help them okay so with this i will i will end my presentation we, we are anyway going to take questions at the end but uh, we'll be, we would love to hear from you uh, if you have any uh, feedback or any questions on this Thank you, Srikant. I think at this point, we're now going to hand over to Rob so he can walk us through how process discovery can uh, open and present opportunities for improvement. Rob, over to you. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining today. Um, I'll be brief here. I'll talk to you for about 10 minutes around what we've been really seeing around the the, the the process optimization and the and the automation um, market here, um, and it's been evolving for for a while. So, um, so so let's start off with kind of you know what's going on in the world. Um, what are the folks who, who come to Forrester and talk to us about um, about process optimization? What are they really talking about? They're they're talking about becoming a digital organization. They're talking about making software in expression of how they do everything in their business. And, and if we boil that down, the way you do business today is, is, is through processes. That, that, that's, that's really what we're talking about. We, we have processes that support customers. We have processes, if you're in government, that support citizens. Um, if you're in healthcare, we've had processes um, that, that support patients. Um, and, 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 and all of these things are ripe for, for automation. And, um, and it's been an interesting journey because we've been talking about this now for, for quite a while, um, for quite a number of years. I mean, we can go back to business process re-engineering, you know, a la Michael Hammer. Um, but, but even in the course of the last four or five years, we've increasingly see, seen process improvement uh, and, and increasingly the tie to automation become strategic. When we ask folks and we ask them this survey, we've done this survey now four 
that's driving your process improvement efforts. Um, you know, traditionally we had seen cost reduction. This was this was kind of the primary driver, but now we're starting to see this align to acceleration of digital transformation, business transformation, and increasingly align with improving customer experiences. These suddenly are very strategic outcomes, and these are outcomes that are that are aligned with business objectives. So. You know, so traditionally these things were always two years ahead. You know, two years from now we're going to be we're going to be focused on these strategic objectives. Right now we're just going to take some cost out. Well, that shifted, and it shifted in early 2020, um, where where all the things we've been talking about around the digital organization, automation at scale, and, and making process improvement and and process optimization part of your organizational DNA came into focus, and then hit COVID. And, um, and things changed with COVID. Well, what changed? Well, thing number one was a lot of processes broke. That, that much we knew. Um, my inquiry load just about doubled as folks tried to figure out how to get broken processes online. File folders weren't being passed. People weren't co-located. Mail rooms were not being attended. Um, things were just fundamentally broken. And, uh, uh, and we also knew that there were new budgetary and, and economic realities. So that often causes people to retrench and start to, you know, to lock down budgets. Um, and, and so we refielded the survey. And if you look at the blue lines here, what you see is that the strategic objectives remained in place. Even through the economic downturn, through all the things that happened as a result of COVID, we stayed focused on trying to become more digital in our businesses and, and focusing on, on customer experience. You'll see on the bottom, cost reduction increased. We went from 6% just before uh, COVID as the primary driver to 13% right afterwards. But that's a doubling from a small base. And, and, and you know, we, we look at this and say, even though cost reduction remains important, 77% of people of organizations still intend to measure it. They still think it's going to be an outcome, but it is an outcome. It is no longer the primary driver. Um, and so we have to think about this very differently. To become a digital organization, this is not about bringing in, you know, the big systems integrator and having them do the big EPM project. You know, that's traditionally how we thought about automation, turning the aircraft carrier. This is very different. Um, and those big projects are going to remain in place. We're going to continue to do work like that. But increasingly, it's going to be augmented by the next 50 thousand process optimization opportunities that we're looking at in order to support this broad strategic efforts that we're making. And that's more like turning speedboats in unison. You have to think about this differently. The tools and the methodologies that you bring to bear have to be very different. So, uh, so some things change. The first thing that changes is that we begin to think about discovery and analysis, tools that we're talking about today, things like task mining and process mining, we have to do them at scale. And you can see that the market is embracing this idea. So 19% of organizations have these tools in place today. Within that, 28% are planning to expand their usage. Another 27% are planning to use these tools net new. Why? Because they allow us to get objective output and they allow us to do it at scale. Just you know, some, some quick comments about process mining and task mining. I, I like the idea of describing Process mining as the freeway, that's where your process, you know, executes. It happens through things like event logs that we can we can track, but there's many off-ramps that happen. And those off-ramps tend to happen on the desktop. And, and we think of that as task mining. And when we pull these things together, we start to get a true end-to-end -end view of what a process looks like. So um, I won't go too deeply into this, but, you know, suffice to say that together, they drive, you know, really strong viewpoints around process and a baseline for thinking about process re-engineering. Some of these things can be uh, achieved through process optimization. When we look at them, some of them could be achieved through deployment of RPA bots. Others could be uh, achieved through, you know, th through through other types of integration, through other types of technology. But we now have this end-to-end -end viewpoint. And this is something that I think is is just emerging in the market. This this idea of being able to pull things out of a process mining environment, marry them with things that are happening from a task mining perspective and, and get this new end-to-end -end objective. And we think, we're, we think it's big, we think we're, we're very excited about it. The next thing you do is you, you have to think about your output of that. What do you do with that information once you have it in hand? Well, you start to do things like model and document what the process should look like. Don't just automate it. 
Don't just pave the cow path. Start to think about this in terms of how you would re-engineer the process and optimize it given new technologies that are available, given new operating models that are available, and given that backdrop of trying to move towards better customer service and, and digitizing your organization. <clears throat> and this really becomes part of the DNA of the organization, this constant looking at re-engineering and constant re-evaluation. Um, and from an automation perspective, my heavens, we've got, we've got plenty of automation. That, that's the least of our worries. We have digital process automation solutions that allow us to build and orchestrate and drive new types of processes. We have really, really strong emerging capabilities around robotic process automation. We have low code tools. We have all of the things that we have from a technology perspective that allow us to be far more agile than we've ever been before. But what we would ask you to do is to say, just because we have all these new cool automation tools, doesn't mean we should jump straight to automation. Think about it more holistically than that. <coughs> Excuse me. So the way we see this playing out is that we see a new focus on discovery and analysis. These top two boxes are things that we look at with tools like Edgeworth and Mining that allow us to get really, really strong objective viewpoints into how the process is running today, analyze it and look for opportunities to improve it. From there, we move into documentation and re-engineering. Don't just assume that we're going to automate what we've already discovered. Assume that this is an opportunity <coughs> to change and optimize and refine your process. Then, when appropriate, we move into automation. Automation is not always the answer. I would argue that automation <coughs> is almost always the answer, and that increasingly, I want to ask folks, why would you not automate a process as opposed to why would you automate a process? Those who were more digitized responded much more effectively to COVID, which was just our most recent test of agility and won't be our last. But the piece I think that we have to really focus on here is this repeat. We're going to continue to do this. Once we've made the changes, we continue to do the analysis. Did it, did it make things better? Did it break things? Did it give us the results that we wanted? And what did it teach us in terms of the next opportunity that we have to continue to refine and optimize processes? This becomes part of the organizational DNA. These tools, these interactions become something that everyone in the organization becomes increasingly familiar with. This idea of driving process optimization up through discovery, analysis, re-engineering, and automation is constantly happening. We're continually improving our ability to do this. So with that, I will pass it back to Carl and, um, and we can move on to the next presentation. Awesome, thank you, Rob. Much appreciated insight and uh, true value to hear your take on, on the market and where you see things headed. Um, now, Rosto, I'd like to, to ask that, uh, that you jump in and, and speak to the audience, uh, offering an overview and, and your insights uh, from the mine it and process mining uh, perspective. Over to you, Rosto. Thank you very much. Pleasure to do that. <laughs> All right, guys. So it's a pleasure to be on this webinar. And uh, today, what I would like to do today is definitely, based on our experience, I would like to share with you today the latest trends and the best practices in process intelligence, you know, that can really bring a real value to you. So I will start probably from the point where my predecessors, you know, did it. So, um, actually, you know, talking more about, uh, uh, about this combination of the uh, task mining and process mining. So uh, we came with a, with a uh, special, I will say, concept. We call it Process Intelligence 2.0, together with our friends and partners from Edgeworth, where, as, as everything was already said, you know, combination of two sources of the data, we are talking about the data from backend system and front end. We can really deliver a great result, not only for automation, but overall process excellence. Uh, I would like, to, would like to talk more about the right approach here. So we believe that the best is to start when you're really looking for the real digital transformation and real process improvement and process excellence. It's great to start with process mining first, understand where are the bottlenecks, where are the problems, and then dive, uh, deep dive, you know, in, uh, into that kind of the activities uh, uh, in more detail and really understand also from the very low level 
uh, what exactly, where are the problems, how you can really um, uh, bring the real value to the customer. So if we are talking about uh, the functionalities or, or the features, uh, there is something, you know, called like a hierarchical process mining, where you can, from the top level of the activities, dive into the de details of every click. And then out of that, you can, if you're, we are talking about the process in, uh, uh, process improvement in the RPA. So we are talking about the automation. You can definitely figure out what are the best candidates for automation and, uh, what processes are great for automation, what not, because what is happening on the market, and it was already mentioned, I believe that uh, it's definitely the situation is that everybody's talking about automation, hyper automation, but we believe that it's important to go one step back and really uh, start with the analysis, with the process mining, with the task mining, process discovery. And we believe that the um, uh, process intelligence first approach is the right way to go. Uh, today, I would like to definitely inspire you by the best practices, you know, and the technologies which are really supporting this. So I will jump in this, uh, I will say, I will say um, more like inspirational things, you know, what we believe, where the market is, and the, what is the demand from the customers. So one important assumption, you know, what we are listening from all the market is that it's not right now that this kind of technology like process mining it's not only for the process people, like this all Lean Six Sigma guys or process improvement guys, it's also ready for the business people. So the business people can really benefit from the process mining, you know, and make the data-driven decision from the day one. And how exactly what is needed for that? That's the main question here. So first of all, we believe that one of the things which are really important is the top UI and the easiness of work. So even the business people can use this software and have the result immediately. And that's the one thing. So the easiness of use, the UI, the second very important thing where the market is going is the automation of the analysis. So the, even the business people can get the benefit out of it. So they're like a pre-built functionalities we can give you that can give you the results almost out of the box, importing the data. So one of these functionalities, what I will talk about, it's an AI-powered root cause analysis. What does it exactly mean for the customers? So uh, it's something to think about. You would like to investigate where are the problems, how you can improve your processes. This is the tool which can, uh, with an AI-powered you know, uh, algorithms, they can really find the right combination of the attributes which causes the root causes for you. So where are the problems? Where are the biggest bottlenecks? Where's the highest cost? So you can define what you are looking for in your process. And think about that, uh, give you the example. So uh, in your process, uh, the right combination of uh, the product, type of the product, type of the uh, supplier, type of the country when it's happening could cause the delays in the process. And what is great, with this technology, the product will automatically show you what is the combination of these parameters, these attributes that cause this. So we have this functionally out of the box. The second, I think very important one, what is really popular right now on the market from the customer's point of view, it's like kind of the automatic rework detector. Because rework from other experience, I have some very interesting case studies, uh, what I would like to share with you today. Rework is normally one of the bigger things which cause inefficiencies, and then you can uh, do a cost cutting based on that, implementing this uh, kind of rework, you know, uh, rework part. So uh, what the system is do, so it's ultimately finding unnecessary work and eliminates them. So we have uh, different loops in your processes, and this will automatically detect them. It could be loops which cause uh, delays, which could cause uh, uh, more costs, which can cause uh, you know uh, different things. What uh, and based on that, you can really eliminate these reworks and really uh, progress in your process improvement. The next one, it's not only about understanding the uh, the status of your processes where where they are as is, but it's also looking in the future. So process simulation is very important part of the process excellence journey. 
So, because you can see, you know, is you are not going into the risk, but you can, you have, you have different routes how to get to the, this process of excellence, but you don't know where to go. Sometimes the manager has a problem to decide, okay, we are going the route one or route two or route three with a simulation. You can have a, you can test your hypothesis, you know, and, um, you know, you understand what will happen in the future when you, when you implement it. So it's kind of risk-free proof. Yes, this is the right way to go. And of course, it could be your focus could be on the uh, cause elimination. It could be on the, you know, uh, kind of the, um, uh, it could be connected with, a, uh, you know, uh, improving the process, you know, in terms of the speed, you know, that is much more faster. So it can be used in a very different ways. Uh, the next very important, uh, I believe, uh, thing what we see from the customers are pretty important is the business rules monitoring. It's also connected with uh, not only for the with the process improvement, but also with the uh, use cases like audit and compliance. So this function leads automatically. You can you can set up your business rules, and it's automatically notifying you if these business rules are you know not really compliant or they are not happening. So we have immediately get a notification, and uh, the when the rules are violating, so we can immediately do the actions and, and uh, not have any problems with the compliance. Another one, what I believe it's super important is the really UI and dashboarding, which can help you uh, to, for the business people to see where they are. Because we are here not talking only about, uh, you know, like a one-time analysis. We are talking about a continuous process improvement. So it's about to really having the everyday decisions. And I like really the raw presentation because he was talking about a big tanker, you know, yeah, which is not the right approach, but it's much better to have a synchronized speedboat. And this is exactly what we are doing. So there are many small things what need to be in your organization. And, and you need to have immediate, like all those real time uh, information, what is going on. So you can, the managers, the business people can do data driven decision immediately. So, and this is exactly what you can do here. So you see your KPIs, you see what is happening with your processes and you can do your decisions. Uh, I would like to share with you, just to inspire you uh, with some of use cases, which I believe are pretty typical on the process mining market, just to give you, you know, kind of information, uh, how, what you can achieve here. Because also I like what Rob was mentioning his presentation. There was the information about, you know, that now it's very important that the companies, uh, there is a cash retention for the companies, one of the priorities for the companies. And there is also very important this customer experience, you know, so all the things are super important. So just a couple of very interesting uh, key studies what uh, we have done. You know, they're connected with a large telco provider in procure to pay or able to, there is real ROI. So we are not doing only project for the project, but with a great results. So they have more than 5 million annual savings. Uh, another manufacturing company, uh, which were able in order cash process, you know, have a, also savings um, in more than 1 million per year. Another very interesting use case, which was connected with a, like not only one process, but several processes in the manufacturing company and retail company. So they were using process mining from product design to manufacturing and also to the logistic to the stores. And also they achieved a great results out of it. Uh, then another, from another industry, another type of the process is, it was a loan process in the bank, in the global bank. And it was not about the cost cutting. It was more about um, additional revenue growth. So we, you know, there were great results achieved, you know, uh, more than 6 million, 6 million, you know, uh, revenue growth uh, uh, for this uh, global private bank. Uh, the, another topic what Rob was mentioning was is customer experience. Uh, you know, a lot of retailers are moving now to the, to the e-commerce. Why? Because, you know, during the COVID, this is the only way how they can sell more. So process mining also great for these type of the customers. So based on uh, uh, analysis of the you know, reasons of returns, you know, highlighting results, satisfaction, uh, again, there was a RR more than 1 million, you know, capturing additional revenue. And more, it was more about also customer satisfaction, about returning customer back uh, 
to the to the to the retailer. And one of the latest ones, you know, this was more from the insurance business. Uh, it was more about the customer retention. Yes, a lot of companies in the COVID are losing the customers. So sometimes it's it's very important that process mining can help with that. And we were able, you know, to decrease the cancellation rate of the auto insurance contracts. And again, there were great results, more than 1 million every year. So this is kind of the, you know, inspiration what process mining, process intelligence can bring to you. Very practical one. And uh, this is my last slide, just I would like to finalize because uh, it's very important that the customers are not only thinking that, yes, automation is the only cure for my problems. So I need to do automation of every process. Of course, it's not the true. This is a very nice example of that. You see, uh, there were in this project, we did a standard process improvement efficiency project by process mining. Uh, there were, you know, and um, so we were able to cut the cost by 3.2 million on a rework alimentation, change, you know, avoidance, PO bundling and some other things. And compared to the automation, which was also a very nice result, 2.3 million. But you see that even with a standard process mining, with using, you know, all these features like, you know, AI root cause analysis and adding to some points, you know, task mining to that, you can get without automation, you can get even higher results, you know. So what I will, I will recommend you, you know, so my advice will be here to really go one step back from automation and start with a process management initiative as soon as possible. Of course, uh, when uh, task mining is needed, also add it there. And it can really help you to bring to the great results in your process excellence journey. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Ross, so again, for your insights. We appreciate it. As we appreciate the audience for staying with us, we're gonna be moving on to the next section, which is going to be a panel discussion. And we're gonna be bringing together um, some compelling questions and posing those to um, the assembly of folks that we have on. And uh, at the tail end of that, we're gonna be opening up the uh, questions uh, to the broader audience. And we'll field those in real time and, and get you some answers to any anything you'd like to touch on as well as some of the uh, questions that have come up uh, leading up to the to the event. So with that, um, gentlemen, what I what I'll go ahead and do is um, really just kind of uh, tie things back and 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 make uh, some some references to the points that were were covered, which is a number of different things. Uh, there's the the pillars uh, things that come to mind are the the pillars of um, of the joint solution, the uh, the degrees of uh, process efficiency, process automation the benefits of some key features and differentiators, uh, not unlike uh, the simulation that you can find uh, on the MyNet platform or the ability uh, to create process documents and, uh, and benchmarking capabilities that you can find um, through Discover as well. So with that, um, I think we need to, to stick with the, the why, uh, answering that question, the question as to why process intelligence is so important and so essential to every enterprise and um, ultimately how uh, adapting to change in real time can, uh, can really make or break those uh, from, a, from a success perspective. So um, if you would, Rosto, I'd like to ask you the first question. Um, first question is how can enterprises best avail this technology? Can you throw some light on how to start and how ultimately they can identify processes to be automated? Thank you very much. That's a very good question. Uh, so, uh, you know, the approach will be definitely uh, that they will start with the process mining at the beginning, because uh, that's what I was mentioning. That's probably that's the first step to do. And based on the, uh, you know, so first is to really understand, you know, uh, do the first analysis. So really analyze uh, activities, you know, uh, and all the process, so map the process. So process man will give the scope, the framework, you know, uh, that uh, to understand where the companies are with their processes. Uh, and then if uh, uh, it's the outcome of process mining analysis, uh, we see that, okay, 
we need some more information uh, in, uh, to go in deep. So uh, definitely it's great to use a task mining or process discovery. And, um, and so it will be clear. So you are not doing recording for every activity in the process, but just for them where you need more information. And then, so the process model define the scope. And uh, with the task mining, you can really have a detailed data for the drill down. And um, using all these technologies like pattern recognition, noise reduction, mesh linear algorithms, then you know all the results are correla correlating. And based on that, you are receiving really valuable insights about uh, you know, what to do, which processes you know to automate, which has great art for automation, which are not. You can use another techniques, not only automation to, as I uh, spoke about in my presentation, you know, how you can really do a cost cutting or revenue grow. And you can also define some uh, candidates for which can be great for automation. Great, appreciate that, Rosso. Uh, did anyone else on the panel want to uh, chime in and um, speak to that? Or did we wanna maybe take another question? All right, let's, let's go on for another. Um, this time, Rob, if I could call on you. Um, the question here is ultimately, how can enterprises, um, or rather, how do you think process intelligence will play a role in helping enterprises uh, step up their game? Um, can you explain with respect to customer experience, business agility, ultimately, how do they become better at what they do on a daily basis? Well, there's a, there's a few different ways to think about this, Carl, and I, I, I kind of want to throw out a contention that, you know, hopefully isn't too um, challenging to the audience, but, but I would argue that most people do not know how their organization works today. Um, I think we have some, some broadly defined things in, in, terms of, in terms of how we go about, um, you know, serving, you know, serving our customers or how our internal operations work. Um, but generally, you know, if you ask four or five different people, you'll get four or five different answers as to how as to how a given process executes. Um, and I think the other piece that that is um, is clear, and, and most people would admit, be I don't really know what happens outside after it leaves. You know, after it leaves me, what happens as it reaches an organizational boundary? What happens as it moves on to other people in the organization? What do they do? You know, what do they do with their piece of the process? Well, I don't know. That's not my problem, right? So when you think about re-engineering, when you think about reacting to, you know, you know to, to unknown things that are happening um, within, um, you know, outside of your organization, resp responding to an outside event, responding to COVID, responding to, you know, what, what, what's the next COVID going to be? Is it going to be another pandemic? Is it going to be geopolitical? Is it going to be, um, you know, a, a business event? Uh, is it going to be environmental? Is it going to be, you know, a flood wipes out a data center? We just know that these things are happening and that the frequency with which they happen is likely to, um, is likely to increase and that the ability to be able to respond in incredibly quickly uh, and to be able to recalibrate how you respond to these things incredibly quickly is only going to increase, right? So how do you do that against a backdrop when you say the pace of business, just the pace of business, not the response to, not the response, you know, to, to, to an emergency, but the pace of business is incredibly rapid and it changes incredibly quickly. And then put that against a backdrop of saying, I don't know how I work today, right? So, so at, the most, at the most basic level, transparency into what I'm doing today the ability to then apply that to my strategic objectives becomes very, very important. So what are my objectives? My objectives are, I wanna better serve customers. I wanna be able to onboard customers faster. I wanna be able to do it in an automated fashion. That is the goal of the organization. That is the goal that, that my customer experience people are working to. How do I go about supporting that as, as, as somebody whose focus is on process optimization? if I am blind to how my processes are working today? And the answer is that you can't. So, so you start to apply these things in the context of your business objectives. You start to take a step back and say, I, I'm willing to admit that I don't know how my organization works today. And once I see the insights into how it works today, I can begin to think about how do I go about applying that to what are the objectives that I'm trying to achieve 
once I have that in place, I have a much better sense of when something unexpected happens, how do I react to doing it? So, so to me, it's about, it's about objectivity and transparency into how your business is operating today at a level that sits above and separate from technology and technology implementation. But I do believe that it often leads to technology and technology implementation. And, and that a lot of it will be driven by a fundamental desire to drive more automation. But you know what I would ask folks is to say, make process intelligence a discipline in and of itself within your organization. Get the experts that understand how to drive this from an optimization perspective, from a pure process perspective, from an application of technology perspective, and then bring that out to the business so that your business becomes in everyday partners with you in, in these efforts to drive to drive the outcomes that you're trying to get within your, you know, strategically from your organization. Thank you for that uh, sage advice and, and instruction. I mean, um, time and time again, there's many folks out there. When I say folks, I mean, you know, large scale uh, enterprises with very specific uh, capabilities and benefits to certain sectors who take on the uh, the daunting task of building it themselves. And uh, and more often than not, I think it, it's, it's, uh, it stands to reason that utilizing the experts that are out there and, and the vendors that, that have the capabilities and are armed with a really equipped with an army of folks with the expertise to do it on your behalf tends to be the uh, the optimal route to take rather than trying to uh, create things from scratch on your own and also do the other things that you focus on as an organization. Uh, Shrikant, I'd like to, to call on you if you, if you would uh, indulge me for a moment. I uh, wanted to ask, how long does it take to implement these technologies, uh, you know, process uh, discovery and mining? Um, is it take a lot of time before you can see results? And, um, and do you have any examples of any, um, you know, real life or real world uh, examples of when that's, uh, that's come to pass in a beneficial way? I think it's a very important question, uh, Carl. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a general perception that usually these technologies take a very long time and also a lot of effort to actually convert them into real diagnostics and real insights, which kind of, uh, somehow has a perception that it kind of drives the, it defeats the whole purpose. Uh, but I think I just wanted to assure you then and also assure the audience also that it's not like that, okay? And the example that I talked about during, when I was uh, covering my session uh, is where for one of the pharma clients, we did the entire mining and discovery proof of concept within just seven days, okay? that's all it took. And that too, uh, I think a couple of days went primarily into understanding the customer data and the instances of SAP that they have. But the rest is all basically just collating the data that we have for discovery. Yes, it needs data capture, but we have done that within a couple of days in many, many, many clients, not just in this example that I'm talking about, but usually data capture can, is done within a few days. Uh, and then once the data is collated, it's a matter of a couple of days again to convert them into insights and analytics. So it's, it's, not, it's not a lot of time. It's, it can be done within a few days or at max a couple of weeks uh, uh, or so. All it matters is the data need to be available. The, the processes need to be identified. Uh, so if, if that sort of readiness is, is there, I think it, it's a very pretty short sort of exercise. That's great. Thank you for that, Shrikant. Yeah, I think it's uh, it, it's kind of a misconception that you know there, there's a bit of a daunting task ahead. I mean, when you consider the way that we approach uh, capturing the data from the desktop and and making uh, cleansing and making use of it, it's it's very rapid. And then in contrast, or on the other side of the same coin, when you consider the way that um, Minus capabilities leverages pre-existing data, you know, historical uh, event logs and syslog data. From the past, uh, it makes it makes for pretty rapid turnaround in terms of value, and uh, that's what we started to see with many POVs. And I'm, I'm I, I appreciate you kind of walking through and clarifying that further. Um, Rob, I'd like to go back to you if you could indulge me yet again. Uh, this time, I'd like to ask what what are the prerequisites that you see the enterprise uh, the enterprises out there what they should consider before they start to embark on this journey of uh, process excellence. So, so I would reiterate a little bit what Shrikant was saying, which is, which is, it's not that hard to get started. So get started. So, um, you know, so, so start to understand 
how these methodologies and these emerging tools um, can help you um, and, and can drive results. So, so do that today, right? But you, you know that there are soft spots in your organization where you have opportunities to, um, to look for optimization and to you know, apply these types of tools to drive that. Um, but as you're doing that, think about some of the broader implications, right? So, so the things that I'm talking about are, are tending to be pretty, pretty broad and pretty strategic. And oh my gosh, Rob, that's just, this is an awful lot. Sounds like we have to do a bunch of stuff. And the answer is you don't have to do a bunch of stuff to get started, but you're getting started small and you're doing this with an idea towards driving it towards strategic outcomes. So I would say while you're getting started, you're beginning to share the output. You're beginning to, um, to, to, to bring back these wins that you're getting back to the executive level in the organization. So it starts to become part of the organizational DNA that says, these are things that we should support. These are outcomes that we have to support. Why do I want to do that? Because I want to have a lot of people in my organization involved in this. And, and, and that tends to have you know, executive level support or required executive level support. I would say the terrible response that many organizations had uh, with regard to COVID and our ability to handle that unexpected event is being, um, is being amplified at the executive and even at the board level to say, we have to be much more uh, nimble. We have to be able to, to understand how to recalibrate and, and change processes almost on the fly. When you have that type of support, you start to think about aligning stakeholders and you start to think about how do you do this at scale? Well, how do I do it at scale? I understand the tools. I work with the tools, um, but I have experts that work with the tools that can bring that out to the organization and begin to federate the model so that more people can do this more quickly. Uh, and, and I begin to tie these efforts around discovery and optimization into other efforts in the organization that might be focused more on automation, helping them feed their pipeline, helping them understand how to prioritize what is the right technology that might be used for any given situation in order to drive an automated outcome. So, so essentially you're tying this from your business strategy all the way through your execution, which could, which could for many be an automation, but the linchpin here is understanding your processes and understanding your processes and how they change and constantly analyzing them and, and you know, just you know, the, the final comment being, okay, I said start small, think big, but start small. Begin to understand how these tools can actually serve these greater purposes because um, it's a when you see it, you believe it type of thing. When people see the output, particularly at the executive level, they tend to get very excited. Sure. Yeah, that, that's that's a that's a, a very. Uh, salient response. I think that when you quantify findings as well, and, and not just uh, base those findings on the opinion of an expert, um, but actually, you know, reinforcing that from a system level, from, from quantitative uh, and quantifiable data, I think that that goes over well with review boards, and um, it, it makes for uh, greater progress in a shorter period of time. So, I uh, appreciate that again, Rob. I think uh, what I'll do now is I'm going to ask the panel, uh, all of you to respond as you, you know, feel free to jump in uh, whenever you like, but uh, I have a question for, for all of us here, uh, which is now that we've established and understood how and why enterprises should embark on the journey of processed intelligence, um, most important uh, question on everyone's mind is essentially, how can the enterprises measure the ROI? What am I going to get back? How do I, again, on that to, to my earlier point, how do we quantify the return? So what do you guys think? Well, I'll jump in. I mean, the, you know, we're actually very, very good and very mature at measuring things like cost takeout and error reduction as we start to, as we start to, you know, to apply you know, these types of technologies. And, and you know, 77% of organizations that we talk to will tell me that that, that is their plan. <laughs> the cost takeout is great and, and you will achieve it as, as you drive better processes and you will reduce errors. Um, what I would ask folks to then do is to, uh, is to take a step back and say, you know, what are the metrics you're using around customer experience? What are the metrics if you're in healthcare around you know, patient care metrics? What are the, if you're in, if you're in government, what are the metrics that you're using to, to see whether or not you're, you're serving 
citizens more effectively. And this could be, you know, you know, this this could be things happening uh, faster, more effectively. In the case of customer service, could be around things like customer drain or customer satisfaction levels. But are you feeding those broader strategic goals? They they tend to be harder to measure, but they tend to have be much more impactful uh, in terms of the measurement. So. You know, so, so from a measurement perspective, you know, you have the, 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 the more difficult task of aligning it to make sure that it is actually feeding your business strategy, which it will. At the same time, just go take the cost take out and show all the executives, by the way, these programs are paying for themselves. So we're getting these strategic value, but we're not asking for net new budget. We're taking cost out in order to justify the, in order to justify the effort. Maybe I will also answer to this question. So... Uh, based on our experience, you know, customers uh, in some particular processes, they are looking for some type of the improvement. So it could be, as, as Rob mentioned, it could be cost reduction. It could be revenue growth. It could be just speed up of the process. Uh, it could be, you know, so there were different things uh, what they are looking for in their process excellent journey. And what is great, you know, so because we are talking about data here, data analysis uh, in the process mining, so uh, they can, uh, you know, have this continuous process improvement, this da dashboards monitoring, and they can use functions that we call it a process uh, compare, where they can very easily compare the process before they started improvement and after. And they can compare in all different levels. So it could be how the costs were reduced after this kind of improvement. If the revenue was growing, the money flows through the process higher. If, uh, you know, the speed of the performance of the process is higher. So you have a different attributes and you can compare it in the, in the real time, you know, almost real time, you know, what was before and what was after. So I think this is great for the business users to see very transparently how they're progressing. And if it's not where they would like to be, you know, they can do changes. They can do another adjustment analysis or, and, and then implement another changes, you know, and going from the quick wins up to the more details, you know, uh, to in in their uh, process improvement journey. Yep. Very, very. Just, just to add to what I think uh, Rob and Lasto said, uh, just wanted to go one level deeper. And uh, typically, the the kind of uh, feedback that we hear from some of our clients is that these are essentially diagnostic tools, right? So they will tell us what can be done but we still have to uh, sort of invest efforts and, and possibly other costs into actually executing those, those things to actually achieve the, the value. Just wanted to add that some of these tools and especially the discover and discovery kind of tools go one step further. Okay? They actually help you execute those insights that have been delivered. So for example, when suppose one of the insights is that a particular process or a task can be automated Discover does not just stop you by telling that it can be automated. It actually gives you tools there by which you can actually save a lot of effort in automating those tasks. Okay? Some of the uh, features like auto automation, for example, can help you save up to 30 to 50% configuration time alone. Okay? So essentially, you are not just understanding what needs to be automated, but you are already sort of one step ahead in terms of actually automating those tasks. So I think that's another factor that needs to be considered when, when we are talking about the ROI of this joint value proposition. Yeah, that's, uh, those are all, those are all you know, well received. Thank you for offering uh, the response to gentlemen. I think it's maybe a good segue into uh, one of the questions that we have from the audience, which is, you know, how do we manage the people side of the automation or of automation discovery? And I, I think that uh, the ability for um, for discover, uh, Sysdesk discover to really offer um, on its own the the insight into the individual contributor, uh, I think is a good way to lead into that insight in the collective uh, for an organization. GBS, you know, teams across the board can then derive uh, where things are headed as an organization and then tie that to their overall strategy. And I think that that's the end-to-end -end look, and that's the way that it really should be considered. But I'll obviously let the panel answer. I'm not here to do that for you. Um, gentlemen, what do you think? Again, I'll repeat the question. It was, how do you manage the people side of automation discovery? 
No, I think Rakal, I will just take up the first shot, and and I think you you kind of started uh, sort of on the right uh, sort of aspect, which is about Discover can obviously go at a process level and explain and and how the task can be automated, but because we have captured data at a very granular level, it can literally go down to an individual transaction at an individual user as well, essentially giving you insights about how people have been executing the tasks. And that can help you on the people aspect as well. So for example, instead of directly jumping into automation, if you want to, let's say, look at a particular set of people and train them first, okay? Uh, or maybe more, uh, create a more re-engineered process so that people find it easier to execute uh, the tasks. Uh, I, I will give you one interesting example. In one of our Japanese clients, when, when we did, when we ran the discovery purely from an automation angle, one of the interesting insights was that there were about 20% of the uh, task variations that eventually the customer realized that they were not even required. Okay? They were primarily happening because of the uh, lack of knowledge of people. And they were able to straight away, straight away eliminate almost one-fifth of the task variations that were happening. Okay? So, so this is a very interesting insights about, yes, you do start with an automation discovery per se, but pretty soon you start talking about re-engineering and optimization before you go to automation. And I think that's that reflects the people side uh, on the discovery, what you can find. Thank you for that, Shrikan. I think um, it, it also speaks to uh, when we call out the exceptions, the uh, the variance, or, or shall I even say the deviations from a given process, I think that it, it really resonates uh, from a change control perspective. And then um, running, you know, certain key benefits or certain key features like a simulation uh, that really can uh, can can illustrate essentially what direction and what outcome you could see, uh, and ultimately what uh, reduction in potential penalty uh, violations of, of compliance standards, things like GDPR or even um, or uh, other scenarios that uh, you know uh, a change control organization is really going to be mindful of. Um, did anyone else want to comment on that question or, or should we move on to another? Oh, I, I would just add one thing and I, th I think it's maybe, maybe, maybe the biggest thing, which is that um, you have to handhold people to these, to these conclusions that it's going to help them with their job. And, and I think you have to start with the assumption that if you want broad support from this, it's not currently in most part in most people's job descriptions. And I don't think people get up and think to themselves, you know, this is my job today, but I really hope somebody comes and asks me to be part of a process optimization effort. Um, you know, they have their work to do, um, but we have to get them on board. We have to think about change management and embracing them and bringing these tools out to them in a logical way that demonstrates um, demonstrates the benefits and wants them to be involved. But, but, um, but that's a job in and of itself. And I think it's one that from a change management and from an organizational perspective, we don't always spend enough time on. We, we tend to be more focused on technology than sociology, but I think that's a big job and, and the one that we often discount. Yeah, that's a, that's a great comment. I think, uh, Rob, if you consider, you know, the, the very nature of, of consulting, why you, why you have the experts, why you bring them in, to help correct, you know, wrong, uh, let's say, uh, not malicious, but let's just say incorrect or, or in, inopportune decisions with uh, process and policy. They can come in and really re-engineer, you know, the direction of an organization, especially an enterprise. You know, it makes sense in, in, in consideration of what these, these, two, uh, these two products uh, combine into a joint solution, what they can really bring to that consulting organization of whatever shape and size, they no longer have to trouble themselves with the time and investment that they typically would need in doing things uh, manually. They can now uh, really, you know, focus on the uh, the more critical work and and make better use and, and optimize uh, the investment that their clients are making in them. And I think that that's an important point to uh, to really tie back to what you were saying as far as companies building out those teams and practices that may or may not exist yet. I think that, um, you know, uh, consultancies can really uh, start to, to help structure those teams and those can be erected uh, and fast-tracked with tools like this. 
And I have to really, uh, really agree with Rob here because uh, from our experience, we see that uh, if the project is lead only by the process people and the business people are not involved in uh, that uh, particular initiative, normally is not, uh, you know, uh, ending with a great success because all this technology is actually done for the business people that they will achieve their results. So, uh, so there must be part of the team. There must be part of this initiative. And, um, and of course, you know, uh, putting them together, it's, it's normally uh, not easy job, but without doing that, uh, there'll be not a, such a great results. And we are talking even about the continuous process improvement that these people are understanding where they are. They understanding the priorities they need to go through to achieve this uh, this results. There must be a, like a leading part of this initiative. So that's that's some uh, fifty cent from our experience. What we have. Thank you for that, Rosso. And I think that's probably uh, a great point to uh, to go ahead and close that. We've uh, we've reached the the uh, end of the, the duration for our panel discussion. And I just wanted to thank you all uh, for, for participating. And of course, to the audience for uh, contributing some questions and for spending some time with us today to go through, you know, ultimately how to, to, to redirect your organization and, and, and establish process excellence throughout. So thank you again. And uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and close.